So I'm going to start to record this because I've noticed that there are a few people who are missing. So if people are uncomfortable recording, you know, you can shut your screen off or whatever. Um, but so in figure 5.1, I just want to make sure what, what I did is I said, look, if you understand now all the definitions of the blast tools, whoops, let's go back, all the blast tools, we can begin to ask refining questions as opposed to, which is what you're midterm was asking you to do, do you understand that now that we know we can actually isolate specific types of genetic material, we can start to compare them, but in the absence of understanding, say, where they are or what they're doing or what number of cells express them, or if, if all cells express them, you can begin to look more closely to see where they're found inside the genome. So let's get rid of that clear all my drawings, let's get out of here. Let's move on to the next slide. Whoops, too far. Okay, so what this means is, this is the actual EMBL blast return. This is the summary of those E values. Remember, whoops, I had you guys put together a table for the E values from your, your PAM and Blossom scores and you can see that the E values should be descending in value depending upon the familiality, meaning the filialness of each of the alignments. And you can see here that this is that chromosome 11 and that chromosome 11 right there represents that red arrow we saw in the previous figure. Okay, now why we care about this is you actually now have a tabular view that if you do and if you use BLAST to get this table output, you can actually get to all of these other pieces of information where you can see the pairwise alignment, you can see the query sequence, which would be the S, you can see the matching genome sequence, and then we haven't figured out what contig views are yet, except to explain to Christian last class the sort of the construction of them, you can actually see where we're going to go. But more importantly is the next piece. How did we actually get there? We get there because what's happening in the background, right? What's actually going on with the position specific scoring matrix, right? So NCBI uses um, that type of matrix. Let's see if I can get that annotation here, okay? Uses a specific position specific annotation. And what it's doing is that if you remember that sort of really simplistic graph we used back in three and four, now you can actually see this looks like a heat map and this heat map is what's actually generating the scores. And by that, it means it's, being, it's returning the highest value, those which are the most similar with the lowest E score, okay? To make sure that that's actually, they're literally substituting here each of the different amino acids depending upon what's going on with the analysis. Okay, so let's get out of that. Let's go here. And this is what it looks like. So if you're gonna do, if you're gonna use that sort of position matrix analysis, what I want you to see here is that you can do a series of iterative, okay, whoops. Sorry, I'm having a hard time with the computer today. I don't know why. Uh, started last night during a practical. Ugh, things went sideways and just never really covered. Okay, so let's get you out of the way. Let's get you out of the way. And what I want you to see is psi iteration blasts take segments of information and then literally continue towards degeneracy. That's the way you want to think about them. So imagine, if you will, sort of uh, you think there's something that's really strong in terms of a positive hit and you can see the expected value here gives you a, this value you can see that the actual values seem as you're going along to be able to find if this is human we're actually finding some um, fungal structure here i believe it's c al albicans right and what's what you're doing is you're looking for now a different version of beta globin as a result of using that psi blast iterative search. So by by looking at slow or low amounts of degeneracy changing, you can actually see by the time you finish, you've gotten very few similarities, but it's still a legitimate 
query and or subject for further investigation. Take a look at 28% identities versus 25% versus 19% versus 10%. And that's a really good way to figure out the degeneracy as you're going through each of these iterations. So how are we gonna use that? Well, in class, what we're gonna do is, if you're looking for, say, either a nucleotide or a protein, sort of, this is supposed to represent, say, the all the information inside of all databases. So if you keep looking, let's put a drawing in here. Oops. If you keep looking, let's annotate this, away from the beta glubans, you're gonna find each of the different relatives, depending upon how stringent you actually have that Psi blast algorithm being used. And the fundamental limitation in a standard blast sensitivity is its reliance upon PAM and Blossom. You're gonna see that we effectively used PAM and Blossom by increasing and decreasing the stringency. What's happening here in Psi Blast though is it's gonna generate that scoring system that is specific to a group of matches detected using the initial query se sequence. So you could imagine if we had some really small number, I think it's 11 nucleotides, right? 11 nucleotides or 11 amino acids. And you can figure out then how to break, break this apart to start thinking about how we would shuttle the either amino acids or nucleotides as we're moving along. You could begin then to see how degeneracy can occur over time. And it's that degeneracy that we want to understand a little bit better here. Let's clear all of that. I realize I'm talking fast, but if you guys have questions, don't be afraid to ask, okay? So here is why we would want to think about using something like this. And that's because you can use reverse position specific blasting here. And where you're gonna, you're gonna actually literally go using a predefined position and those scoring matrices to find out, take a look at this, this idea that you're gonna have conserved domains within each one of either these proteins and or nucleotide sequences. Because let's imagine this is hemoglobin, right? And we know that there's gonna have to be some binding site between these chains. Imagine, if you will, that those sets of residues should be conserved over time between different organisms. Now, what's going to end up happening is those conserved regions we're going to call domains. And those domains, when you see them throughout domain, when you see them throughout different organisms, okay, in say maybe an ancestral tree or something like, like that, you will begin to ascribe or prescribe responsibilities to each of those domains. Sort of like you think of your fingers for grasping onto things, your teeth for chewing. If you use these as an analogy for what a domain can actually do or families or super families of proteins will have these same shared responsibilities. Now, the chap now, chapter five begins to become very sort of complex, but I wanna introduce this idea when you start thinking about multiple alignments. And you're gonna, we'll, we will set this up in lab on Thursday where we're gonna try and do, we're gonna try and repeat this entire figure here to see if we can get the exact same data. And what I want you to do is see that they're looking for multiple sequence alignments to see just the likelihood you're going to be able to get this outer membrane lipoprotein, and this is gonna be called lipocalin, and we've seen lipocalin before. By choosing RBP4, okay, we're gonna query against BLAST-P, and we're gonna see how far we can actually get down this tree. That's straightforward enough. How does it actually work though? And this is why I actually kind of sort of wish more people were here from Science 114 right now, because this figure should look, whoops, Familiar to people, 
Does anybody from Science 114 recognize this? I do no. not recognize that. You do or you don't? I do not. You do not. Do you guys remember energy transformations? When energy came from the sun, it went between. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we could go from solid forms of energy to, say, nuclear forms of ener energy. And remember, energy is neither created nor destroyed. With me? And if energy is neither created nor destroyed, it's only transformed. So what we're going to do is, or at least what people did when they were writing the code for this, is they said, look, if unless, unless the nucleotide is completely removed, it should mean that the nucleotide has either been translated or transformed into a different nu nucleotide. And can we figure out the likelihood that it's transformed into one of those? And that's actually what you're looking at here. You can figure out the mathematical likelihood of any one of these nucleotides in a really short sequence being converted into something else, a transition to say a T to a C, okay, by that red arrow there, okay, the probabilities of each of those 16 changes can then be collected on a matrix. And I'm going to show you the matrix in a sec second. You need to clear all this stuff first. Now, you're not going to have to actually generate these matrices, but you will have to understand how it is this, and you should be able to explain to me by the time we get to the final, how it is this was actually thought through. And here's that matrix where you can literally come up with, pay attention to what I'm saying here, the possibilities, or more specifically, the probabilities of each of these substitutions actually occurring. And the substitution doesn't have to be at a nucleotide. The substitution can actually be for an individual amino acid that's been switched out. Valine, 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 leucine, va valine. H, 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 you can actually see that those were consistent, but A, I, G, A, G, something's going on here through the evolution of these, right? And this figure should look very familiar to, to you, okay? And this is something similar that I drew. It has to be about, it seems like a lifetime ago though, but where you can actually see, get this crap out of the way, where you can actually see those transformations occurring as we're moving through to explain how it is the individual amino acids converted into the observed sequences. So what's gonna happen here, right? You can have a series of blast N searches that end up with, whoops, end up with a specific size of say 11 nucleotides, okay? And what you're gonna do is mother nature or you computationally can go in and try and assign a value and then see what happens, what it takes to actually get that best fit curve similarity to sensitivity to actually change. And what I want you to see here is the sensitivity is higher over a range of similarities for non-consecutive seeds that are approached. And you'll see what I mean when, in a second when we show you how it's actually done. We're going to skip over this because there's just way too much information there. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, what happens if you use Megablast to go searching for longer sequences as opposed to those short 11 base pair sequences? And you can see if you're looking for non-redundant sequences, in this case, looking through the Pongo pygmagus, okay, which is an orangutan globin series of genes, you're going to see that there are what we're going to call pseudogenes inside class on Thursday. So how do we actually do this? What is a transformation and why am I taking what seems like precious time in your lives to actually you know, explain this to you? And maybe you've done this in your database class. I don't know what you guys actually cover, but if you can imagine, a series of instructions have to be given so that we actually have an N by N matrix here. And that's what we're looking at. That n by n matrix is going to substitute out 
the first letter of that traveling throughout each iterative reversible transformation. So that if what we actually had is abra cadabra, and you have abra cadabra, abra cadabra, abra cadabra, eventually what you end up with is you have abarak, abaraka, akarabra, and all of these compressions and decompressions end up giving you then the end of our matrix so that we end up with a cyclic rotation through the actual, um, how do I say this? The big phraseology they use inside your textbook is called lexography, right? Okay, where what you're doing, of course, is by the time you finished all of this, whoops, shit, sorry about that, guys. By the time you get through all of this, what's happened is you actually get back to the original string. So, and that's kind of ingenious. And it's ingenious because that's what we would say you've done an exhaustive search for similarities, okay? And that may not seem like a big deal, but when you think about your, the first time you actually did a search and it returned, I don't know, what did it return? I don't know, 10 or 15 possibles. And if you did a, um, a, a less rigorous search, you got more and more possibles. By mm, bracketing would be the best way I would put it, by bracketing the matrix that you're using. And in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, by six, zero, one, two, four, five, six. You can see now that the combinatorial reverse transformation led to the compression and then ultimately that decompression gets us all the way back to the beginning. And you're like, well, what the frick does this all mean? Well, what this means is when you're going through chapter five and you're looking at all of the different types, because you're gonna notice I didn't, I didn't go through the list of different blast searches that you're gonna see inside chapter five when you read it. I wanted instead to take this time to focus on, you know, how it is those the thought process is put in behind each of the different types of blast searches and i wanted to spend a couple minutes thinking about sort of like the if you guys are thinking about computer science in terms of how you design exhaustive searches to find materials that are not necessarily known this is how you would go about doing it so do you guys have any questions no michael you there Markel, Hello. you awake? No? Okay, well, um, nobody has any questions, so let me check email messages here. Professor, I was just able to get in. I'm, yeah, Land Landon, you just got in. Yeah, it didn't ask for a password this time. I don't know what changed, but... Okay, yeah. so, so what we did is um, we went through um, chapter five. You've, you've missed chapter five, but what I did is I recorded it, right? So I'm gonna spend some time trying to figure out. Um, and yeah, there were five, four or five people here. I don't think many people are actually paying attention though. So, cause nobody's <laughs> responding when I ask, you know, if they understand what I'm talk talking about. Uh -huh. um, but um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and figure out how to convert this mp4 into something you guys can actually see on blackboard um i looked at your exam you know nice job in terms of like you know sort of getting aggressive and thinking about some of the questions how do you feel it, it, it went um i mean better than survey of science but i, I i'm still <laughs> not sure okay well i mean obviously i haven't put any grades on anything yet um i am sorry about uh not being able to log in i don't know what happened um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't really know. <laughs> okay. So here's your, your marching orders for Thursday, right? Chapter five essentially is a list of different types of blast searches that you can do that are available for you to do. And what I did is I spent about 20, 25 minutes talking about how it is they actually do the transformations in sort of the background coding piece. And what I want you to do is pay attention to Psi blast and mega blast 
in terms of making sure you like you have a definition of what these things are. So when we actually work through some of the lab on Thursday, you'll have an idea of what I'm going to do. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think the rest of the class is actually sleeping because, uh, you know, <laughs> I think a lot of people were up really late last night. I'm here. I'm just absorbing your information. I'm sorry? I'm here, but I'm just absorbing your information. Yeah, no, and please, please don't think I'm taking, I mean, I'm making fun of you or anything like, like that. I mean, I, I completely get that people are utilizing sort of like their, their thinking and pro, their listening and processing skills. Um, but I really don't have anything else to add at this point in time. So unless you guys have questions, I'm going to let, let you go. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay, kick ass. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and figure out now how to take this recording and get it up on Blackboard for you. That'd be great. Thank you. Kick ass, man. Have a great morning. You too. Have a good one. Be safe, guys. Where do we upload the midterm? Oh, you're supposed to turn it into a PDF and e e email it to me, Kyle. Okay, what do you have as a PDF? I'm sorry? I have it as a PDF. Your email is on the syllabus? Yeah, so email it to my work email, which is the email, you know, for jmcmenamanbeleno at ncc.comnet.edu. The one on the syllabus says norwalk.edu. Please don't use norwalk.edu. We found out the hard way that it doesn't get to me. So, um, okay. can you say it again, your email? Sure. It's ncc. Dot ncc. Yeah. Comnet, C O M M N E T, dot edu. And if I don't hear from you, Kyle, I'll send you a message. Okay. Okay. Buzzer. Coolio. Have a good one, man. Bye. Bye-bye.